So hello, everybody, and thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, my name is Beth Carter. I'm the curator at the Bill Reed Gallery of Northwest Coast Art located in Vancouver. And we are so excited to have you join us today for this wonderful presentation. Uh, I would like to start off by acknowledging that the Bill Reed Gallery is located on the unceded ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil nations. And we truly appreciate being able to do our work on these beautiful territories. Um, the Bill Reed Gallery, for those who don't know, is the only nonprofit gallery with a focus on contemporary Northwest Coast art. And uh, we thank you for joining us today for an unbroken line, which uh, with guest speakers Nika Collison and Gwai Edenshaw. This is our final talk in a series of talks we've held this fall that are all related to our current feature exhibition, which is called To Speak with a Golden Voice, which was co-curated by Gwai and myself in honor of Bill Reed's 100th birthday. And this is a series of talks, have, uh, they've been a collaboration between the Bill Reed Gallery SFU Indigenous Studies and the Bill Reed Center at SFU. And I would also like to thank the great team at the SFU Public Square for making today's event run so smoothly. It's really been great. Uh, we're making plans for more talks and uh, presentations and workshops in 2021. So I do invite you to keep an eye on the Bill Reed Gallery social media or sign up for our monthly newsletter and uh, to stay informed. So just before we get started on the actual event here, I'd like to go through a few uh, housekeeping bits, just so you know that we are doing closed captioning for this event. If you would like to see the closed captioning, you can turn it on or off by clicking the CC button on the black bar at the bottom of your screen. It should be on your right. Um, and thank you to AI Media for providing this service. I would like to apologize in advance for any Indigenous names, words, or terms that may be inaccurately reflected in the closed captioning uh, throughout the talk. The captioners are doing their very, very best and uh, to be prepared, but um, we know that some of these terms may be unfamiliar with them, and we'll try and uh, fix those uh, for the recording if needed. Um, we are also recording. And so please note that this will be recorded for uh, to be shared later on, uh, especially for those who couldn't make it this afternoon. Uh, now, we will be taking some questions. So please submit your questions and we'll remind you a bit later. Uh, we encourage you to ask questions in the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of your screen. And you can submit questions anytime during the event. Uh, you can also enter comments or questions into the chat if you'd like to engage with fellow participants. And we'll be monitoring uh, this channel for questions, but we do recommend that you use the Q&A. It makes it easier for us to follow. We'll do our very best to get to as many questions as possible, but depending on how many, we don't know if we'll get them all, but we'll try our best. So on to our main event. I'm really thrilled to welcome Nika Collison and Gwai Edenshaw, who will speak about their own personal relationship to Bill Reed and also his place within Northwest Coast Art and also other interesting things that they're involved in. Uh, Jisgang Nika Collison belongs to the Tsal Eagle Clan of the Haida Nation. She's the director curator of the Haida Gwai Museum at Kalnagai, specializing in Haida art, history and culture. She serves as a senior negotiator for the Haida Repatriation Committee, and she also works to build partnerships with museums around the world. She's in great demand as a curator, a writer, and a knowledge keeper of the Haida people. We're so appreciative, so appreciative of Nika's long-term relationship with the Bill Reed Gallery, and uh, she is also Bill Reed's granddaughter. Uh, and Gwai Edenshaw is a jeweler and a pole carver, and he was the guest curator, as I mentioned, of the exhibition to speak with a golden voice. Uh, Gwai is a founding member of Kaltsidaka Storytelling Society. I apologize, I probably didn't say that correctly, and a scholar of Haida culture. And he was Bill Reed's final apprentice. Uh, Gwai's most recent collaborative work is Gawai Kuna, the award-winning feature-length film set entirely in the Haida language. So I'm sure we're going to hear more about some of these things, but I'm going to now turn it over to Nika, and she's got wonderful images, and I'm looking forward to hearing her speak as always. Our best. 
singait la de langwa luhan de langwa luhan staurigi gasul kel la just gang hanudik i gaga ni kakalasen hanudik i gaga yats khaira ga khiski wagen gaslayu di lana auga skile hanudi khaka git khois hanudi auga as kawas if you're there dangarik u gaga we um so hello everyone uh my name is nika and and i'm very and i'd like to thank gallery and you for the info exhibition to golden voice and um so I'm here to talk about Bill, but you can never quite talk about um, Haida present without the past. So we'll move on to the next slide. So, um, yeah, I'm here to speak about Haida art, culture, and Bill, but first I'll start by speaking about the Haida language. Haida Kill is a linguistic isolate. There is no other language related to it in the world. Born from the lands and waters of Haida Gwaii, it is not just a language. It is a different way of thinking, seeing, and knowing. It is Haida knowledge, history, and wisdom stored. It defines our intrinsic relationship to the lands, waters, airways, and supernatural beings of Haida Gwaii, that which makes us Haida. Wait. Wait. Haida art also embodies a way of life and a way of knowing unique to our people. Oh, you can go back one. Together with the Haida language, our art tells our histories, conveys family lineages and privileges, indicates social standing and reminds us of our relationship with others. It plays an important economic function, is central to ceremony and can be highly political. It expresses and strengthens our connection to the supernatural and the spiritual. It affirms and honors our inseparable relationship to and dependency upon the lands and waters of Haida Gwaii. And it moves us figuratively and literally. And it reminds us of our place in this world. Haida art is also beautiful. It's a beauty attained through dedicated artists like Gwaii, who along with being skilled in design are knowledge holders, historians, storytellers, philosophers, architects and engineers. They know the lands and waters from which their materials come. They know how art functions in Haida society. They are dedicated to studying the masterpieces of the past and then learning from the masters of today and are dedicated to passing their passion on and their knowledge. These artists want to know what makes great art and they want to make great art. Wait. Bill Reed was one of these artists. Two of his Haida names were Iljuas and Yasquansing. He was born in 1920 to a Haida mother and Scottish father. He moved on from this world in 1998. Because we follow our mothers in the Haida nation, that means we're following our lineage, property and rank from our mum. And Bill followed his mother, Sophie Gladstone, who belonged to the Kaurisqa Kigawai or Raven Wolf clan of Tanu. Wait, Sophie's mother was Sudaf, daughter of Chief Daniel Iljuis. That's her there. Wait, Sophie's mother was Haida artist Charles Gladstone, a maternal nephew of Charles Eden Shaw, who was a hereditary chief and master artist. So that's Charles in the center front of the canoe there. Wait, <laughs> I'm, I was, just so you guys know what I'm doing is I'm letting my friend know when to move the slides. Within each clan, one can find people holding positions of varying rank and responsibility, including but not limited to matriarchs, chiefs, and ceremonial leaders, the skaga or medicinal practitioner, gaisigang, the one who watches the waves so the canoe can get out, slinel, those with clever hands, the artists. Wait. Historically, every Haida clan also had a professional storyteller that kept our extensive oral histories intact, including those that predate human occupation on earth. 
From this we know our people came out of the ocean, some, des some descending from, but not limited to, supernatural beings such as Anna, the killer whale, others from the daughter of Skuluja, foam woman, others from the daughters of Jilakuns, creek woman, and still others from those who washed ashore inside a giant clam or cockle shell. The creation of Haida Gwaii in North America and the geographic and supernatural events that followed are retained in our oral histories and art, such as, we'll just say next slide, Kaugajat or Ice Woman, who helped us find, who helped our people find refuge during the Ice Age. Uh, next slide. Ah, the pine tree which uh, grew after the last ice age around 12 to 14,000 years ago. And it was the first tree to grow on Haida Gwaii after the ice age. Uh, go ahead. About 6,000 years ago, the Ju or red cedar tree appeared on our peep appeared and our people became dependent upon her for most things needed to survive and prosper. Of all cedar creations, the Haida canoe was perhaps the most important. Taught by the supernaturals, our ancestors engineered canoes up to 24 meters long, permitting ocean travel between villages on Haida Gwaii and to offshore fishing grounds. These vessels also provided access to the Pacific Northwest coast and beyond, greatly advancing our economy and technologies. Oral histories say these canoes took ancient Haida on journeys as far away as Japan and Hawaii. Our, our oral histories also tell of strangers who happened upon our islands. The first accepted written documentation recounting the meeting of our ancestors and old world explorers occurred in 1774 when the Spanish sailing ship Santiago entered, entered into Haida waters. Captain Juan Perez and his crew noted the Haida were skilled in trading as, as they endeavored to acquire our fine weavings and carvings. British explorers soon followed in the wake of Juan Perez. In 1778, Captain Cook traded for sea otter pelts on the Northwest coast, setting off a maritime fur trade for which Captain George Dixon arrived years earlier in, I don't know why I wrote it like that, in 1787. Dixon, he traded almost 2,000 pelts and decided to name Haida Gwaii the Queen Charlotte Islands after his ship and queen. We respectfully gave that name back to England in 2010. Sea otter fur was so highly prized in China that over 200 ships would come to our shores over maybe 40 years. While explorers sought these riches, they also sought fine weavings, carvings, and other art forms from our ancestors and also enjoyed the local fare. Go ahead. Iron was the commodity most prized by our people. Artists transformed this precious metal into tools for carving, construction, fishing, and hunting. While in our possession before contact through shipwrecks and trade routes, iron was so readily accessible through Europeans that they soon earned the, na the name Yatskaidega, or iron people. Other desired trade items included muskets, iron pots, beads, buttons, cloth, and Hudson's Bay blankets that were turned into beautiful robes worthy of the highest ranks. Go ahead. Classical Haida art created for social function and economy soon found company in lifelike sculptures of Europeans and their exotic possessions, masterfully depicted in argillite, ivory, and wood by the Haida, highly sought after by European explorers. Maybe our artists thought this subject matter was too foreign to be captured by an art form derived from and or or for a Haida way of life, or maybe they were inspired to explore a new style of art introduced by folk from the old world. Either way, the form is a drastic departure from that of classical Haida formline art, but maintaining a high aesthetic achievement. And while new markets of fur and art brought quicker, greater wealth, they also brought much troubles. The sea, hot, the sea otter was hunted to near extinction. Our social structure was thrown out of whack and distrust and disharmony between coastal nations and European traders began to rise. Charles Edenshaw was born during these times in 1839 in the village of Skidigat. Go ahead. Beginning in the latter half of the 1800s, foreign epidemics and attempts at colonization silenced the ways of Indigenous peoples up and down the Northwest Coast well into the mid-20th century. 
smallpox, and other disease saw over 95% of our people die. This near annihilation of our people and of the knowledge, history, and traditions that went with them marked the beginning of the silent years. Despite never surrendering the lands or waters of Haida Gwaii, the survivors went on to face Canada's Indian Act, which put our people on reserves and governed their day-to-day -day lives. In 1884, the Indian Act was amended to include the potlatch ban, effectively making our legal systems illegal. While there's not enough time to explore what the Act entails, the fact that it was used to inform the development, uh, part of the development of apartheid in South Africa says enough. In the same era, missionaries arrived. Well-intentioned, the church wanted to help us, and most certainly they did, but they did not understand our way of life and discouraged and forbade our ceremonies and customs and in so in a roundabout way and then sometimes on purpose created harm. During this time and far into the 20th century, Haida graves were desecrated, the skeletal remains of hundreds of our ancestors were taken, and thousands of cultural treasures were stolen by various Indian agents, missionaries, anthropologists, and explorers. What wasn't stolen during this period was given or sold under duress, so that by 1900, almost nothing was left in our own homes. Go ahead. In the late 1800s, Canada and the church for um, entered into a formal agreement, creating both the church-run day schools and that were in villages and the residential school system, which most children were forced to attend. Thousands of Indigenous children across Canada spent years away from their families, often subjected to severe abuses. The children were also forbidden to, from talking to other relatives and punished should they speak their language. And so the silence grew. Go ahead. Despite all of this, many went on to succeed in this new world by adapting Western practices to a hideaway of life, acting as conduits between past, present, and future, and our ancestors continued to practice their culture in secret. When information could not be passed down by traditional means was preserved through our ancestors working with Westerners to record our, our cultural knowledge. Go ahead. An extraordinarily gifted artist, storyteller, and leader, Charles Eden Shaw is recognized as one of those who works, whose work carried our people and culture into the 21st century, creating a significant artistic legacy within a stunning story of survival that drew on Haida values, systems, beliefs, and the ability to adapt and innovate. Go ahead. As the masters passed on and colonial regimes deepened, most of the artists of the mid 1900s had no one to apprentice with and no access to masterworks, but they continued on in the arts, nourishing their spirits, providing for their families and leaving a legacy for future generations. Through all of these acts, our ancestors ensured a door was left open for their children, an opportunity to strengthen their hideaway way of life while at the same time succeeding in the contemporary world. Inspired by these legacies, a new generation of artists did just that. Go ahead. Drawing on the gifts provided by both living knowledge holders and those living before us, young artists such as Bill Reed, who was born the year Charles Edenshaw died, began to carve out a new chapter in Haida history, weaving the past into the present and designing our future, if you will. By the latter half of the 20th century, Haida art had begun, it, had begun its ascent back into our daily lives, and it began to move beyond anthropological study and into the arena of the international art world. Go ahead. Along the way, the remains of over 500 of our ancestors were repatriated, as were some of our cultural treasures. Together, our nation and museums like the Pitt Rivers Museum have forged, have forged positive and leading edge relationships along the way. Local churches have reconciled with our communities, working with the Haida to incorporate our values and beliefs into their services. While many are not Christian, there is still a following, with some Haida embracing Christianity to the point where they've become church leaders, like my Auntie Lily, an Anglican church minister. Go ahead. The revitalization of the art brought our cultural practices back out into the open. Today, children grow up knowing the raising of poles and the paddling of canoes. They've slept in long houses and they live off the land. They're adorned with fine hats and regalia as we put our chiefs forward. They begin singing and dancing in the womb. While the Haida language is endangered with fewer than 20 fluent speakers alive today, it is being diligently recorded by our elders and taught to our children and adults. Go ahead. 
the work of the artist keeps us conscious of our relationship to the supernaturals, to the Haida and to each other. Master artists of today remind us that the masters of the past and our elders are our teachers. They maintain that despite progress, we still ha all have much to learn and achieve. Go ahead. The ongoing learning provides occasion for everyone to better understand our shared histories and themselves. In this, we are not only moving our own lives forward, we are redefining our relationship with Canada in the world. And so this too is the role of Haida art. As my cousin Clayton Gladstone, an artist, reflects, it brought the rest back out. That is how important the art is. Alongside our own reemergence, some changes have been made to the Indian Act, such as dropping the potlatch ban in 1951, but really all of it should just be done away with. In 1996, Canada's last residential school finally closed. Over the past few years, thousands of survivors of residential schools have worked with the Truth and Reconciliation Com Commission of Canada to try and reconcile an incredibly dark chapter in Canada's history. And at the end of 2015, the TRC came out with a list of 94 recommendations, which the new Prime Minister of Canada said he committed to seeing through. Go ahead. We've survived biological, hmm, I'm not sure. What slide does that say you're on? I'll go ahead anyways. Yeah, the slides are mixed up, but I think it's okay. They're all good pictures. So we've survived biological and cultural genocide, but we cannot survive the killing of our lands and waters. As we make every effort to strengthen and continue Haida culture, one of the biggest hurdles we face is our land dispute with Canada, for it is our relationship to Haida Gwaii, to the natural and supernatural, that has brought each piece of Haida art into being and makes us who we are. Our nation has made great progress over the past decades in gaining say over the management of our lands, waters, and airways. But while our Haida nation's inherent rights and title to Haida Gwaii have been acknowledged in Canada's highest court of law, they continue to be ignored by the Canadian government and our resources remain at the mercy of industry. Our greatest threat right now is dirty oil oil and liquid natural gas, should they be sourced from or transported through Indigenous territories, this could be the most successful in taking our people out. This industry not only rapes the lands and waters, it kills the lands and waters. Uh, go ahead and who, who I'm, oh, go ahead again. And again. And again. <laughs> Going back to Bill. You can, hmm, that is weird. Okay. Going back to Bill. Bill's story is one shared by many of his generation who inherited the silent years. He really only got to explore his heritage after childhood a product of both the church-run day schools and the residential school system, his mother Sophie did everything she could to be mistaken for a Victorian lady. They lived off island, they went back to visit once in a while, but um, really he, he didn't go there much as a child. He remembers his, his mother's and auntie's bracelets. He knew his chinai, Charles Gladstone, and through Gladstone, he was exposed to wondrous works. And then Bill went on to find in museums. And then he got to know his great uncle through more of those fabulous works. On one trip home early in Bill's artistic career, he also spent considerable time with Henry Young, one of the last formally trained oral historians who shared numerous stories with Bill. Inspiration took hold and here we are today speaking of Bill. My work and way of life has been hugely influenced by Bill Reed. I grew up not knowing the silent years. I grew up during a great time of revitalization, witnessing and participating in the pole raisings, singing and dancing, canoeing, all of the firsts that came out of the hangover of colonization. I didn't really realize these were monumental moments until I was much older. I was six years old when my chin I moved to Haida Gwaii to carve the Skidigit dogfish pole, assisted by Gwaii's father, Gu Zhao. 
Seth, I think if you can jump to slide 31, we'll catch up or slide 32. I grew up with Bill's prints um, throughout our house and both my nanai and my mum had his jewelry. So that was another exposure. But Lutos was perhaps the most formative time in my life. Created to open Expo 86, it was the first monumental canoe to be made in decades. We led in, we led in a grand flotilla followed by Prince Charles and Princess Diana following behind its, us in their yacht. I lived with Bill and his wife Martine during this time. From there, Lutos went on many adventures. You can go to the next slide, Hawasa. Most incredible and most important to me was paddling her home in 1987, following an historic tra uh, trade route from Vancouver up the Northwest coast and across the Hecate Strait to Haida Gwaii. For years, Lutos went on to participate in weddings, funerals and other ceremonies, races, blockades, food fishing, the, late, the list goes on. In 1998, she brought Bill home to his final resting place in Anu. In, 20, in 2012, she retired. She now lives alongside the Skidigit Dogfish Pole, which retired shortly after. They serve their roles and their community with grace and are now moving aside for the next generation, but they're sticking around so that we can continue to love and be with them and learn from them. There is a practice in our culture called putting a string on someone. For example, during the times of arranged marriages, a family of a very young girl might endow a great deal to the family of a young boy, effectively putting a string on that child, ensuring the two would one day marry and move forward in life together. I like to think that Charles and Bill and all the others that have put a string on their work, binding us to something that is so much more than art, I like to think that they made sure we'd come together in the future when the time was right. Hawa. Hawa. Do I just dive right in? I guess that's a yes. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you, Guy. Uh, I'm Gwai Yinsa. Uh, I also go by Ugitka. I'm Chaf people from the Haida Nation. Uh, it's really uh, great, uh, if a little intimidating, to, to follow Nick. I, I feel so. Um, uh, like it's going to school or something for me. Um, one of the, I, I'd just like to put a finer point on some of the things that, that she's been talking about. You know, um, you know, she talks about the, the silent years um, and the um, activity that that carried us through those silent years, you know, the, the impression that uh, the world and, and I think to a degree, some of our own people have is, is that our culture disappeared. I think that's sort of the, the essence of this idea of the unbroken line um, is that we always had people who were, um, bastions of our culture that were carrying us us through that time and um you know as as she mentioned uh charles edenshaw um, um bringing the art to uh, uh new heights inside of his own life um but even people who who weren't necessarily natural born artists like Charles that continued to um, produce work and to carry the culture forward. Um, and, you know, in my dad's and his cousin's cases, uh, you know, during their time, their nanai would put 
towels up on the on the windows and just wrap them in blankets and have them dance around the wood stove. So carrying on the culture, even though the potlatch ban was still active at that time. Uh, like Nika, all that was news that I had to learn down the line. You know, when I was born into the world, I, I had the benefit and the privilege of, of the people who came before Bill Reed, Robert Davidson, Jimmy, my dad, and, and many, many others uh, um, who had done sort of all the heavy lifting and, and um, you know, and so there was just no question about uh, whether I was supposed to be proud about being a Haida or being, uh, being Indigenous at all. Um, one of the things that is a bit of a mystery to me is, uh, you know, throughout all that time, you know, anthropologists being able to uh, spend lots of quality time with, with a guy like Charles Edenshaw, who clearly understood the art, um, you know, was a, was a scholar of all the formalities of the art. Um, and yet, uh, to our knowledge, there's very little of the language around how the art went uh, together. And it's, it's really hard to imagine um, that that uh, there wasn't words for it, and yet uh, we we don't see anything. Um, you know, when we look at how um, colonization works, um, you know, one of the things that they do, one of the things that they did to us, but something that you see just all over the world as well is is uh, you rename something. And so, um, you know, the Haida people, we have all kinds of names that were imposed upon us. Uh, Nika mentioned the Queen Charlotte Islands, um, but it's all over the world. You know, the um, Japan is, is not Japan to the Japanese. Um, Holland is not Holland to the Netherlanders. And, and so on. And what we got in the uh, 50s was, was uh, Bill Holm uh, assigning a language to our art. And honestly, it's been very helpful to Haida artists and Northwest Coast artists in general. Um, we've been able to elevate the art um, by having uh, a way to talk about it and address the, you know, the, the tricks and idiosyncrasies of the formality of the art. Um, but that just shows all the more that there had to be a system and a way of talking about it in place. Um, so me and my little brother, Jolin, uh, set out uh, quite a few years ago now. I've, I'm, going to say more than a decade ago, um, to see what we could discover, you know, through research, where there might be some information buried uh, about, about how our language was referred to, uh, and or through recreation. In the, in the case of discovery, you know, we could find inside of some interviews where um, in English they would refer to the ovoid as the eye. So they would say, you know, the eye in the shoulder, the eye in the hip. Um, and so that was our, star our starting off point. One of the, one of the 
rules that we set out for ourselves that are is that the words that we would come up with would have to have the same utility that Bill Holmes words said. So, um, you know, they had to be succinct um, and they had to um, hopefully uh, provide something that was essential about the form element. Um, we were, and, and ideally we we're drawing from the Haida language first. So Hans Kuhl is uh, eye socket. And when you think in, in English, we, we simplified that to socket form so that it could help somebody who's transitioning through the, through the ways of looking at the art. Uh, so when you say the socket form in the shoulder, the socket form in the hip. It's telling you something both uh, essential about what the form does, uh, as well as as well as uh, referencing this this old piece of Haida knowledge. Um, you know, an ovoid is uh, it it means oval ish. And, uh, you know, but an eye socket actually has something else that is intrinsic to the ovoid, you know, the ovoid being this, this ovalish shape, but uh, with a, a convex upper and a concave lower form. Um, we also looked into um, the, Haida language is is uh, is based, or 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 at least contains uh, these shape classifiers. So when you when you're looking for something, an object, that how you refer to it um, is modified by um, the shape that it is. So if you're talking about uh, something that is cylindrical shaped, uh, you know, part of asking for it would be, you know, pass me that cylindrical shaped thing or pass me that, that flat shaped thing. Um, the word in, in uh, Haida for, for, we use it for nose, Kun uh, is also the word that we use for the U shape. Now the the U shape, uh, it's also the same word for uh, a whale's fin, and in fact it is a, a shape classifier. So it refers to a bump in the road. It refers to a point of land, and in essence, it refers to something that comes off of something else. And that's where the intrinsic element comes from. So, so uh, the U form, kunju, as, as we say it, uh, is the first piece of, of Haida element that cannot exist on its own. So it necessarily has to be coming off of another thing. Um, the, the overall art, we, you know, we call it form line art. That's the Bill Holm term. Um, me and Jolin came up with, uh, Saju or Saju Ani. That's, uh, Saju is an element that is uh, described as a um, like an octopus's leg that covers the the pinch in the line, or a river, or a, a path, a road, um, but it can also be a story or a song. So uh, again, this this carries a, a fundal fundamental element of what 
is happening with the the so-called form line you know it's it is telling a story um and saju ani that means um sort of the all the bones of this storyline and that's what that's what uh the form line is it's the fundamental structure of of the art um in i don't want to get too much in the weeds but i feel like i got to keep on going now um with a couple other things so um the other if you're familiar with the art at all if you're not then i'm probably just uh confusing as heck but um Another element you might be familiar with is the is the salmon trout head, and this is this gets to some of the crux of the of the problem the, uh, with renaming because the the so called salmon trout head um, comes out of a description that was relayed to, uh, or printed in Boas. It wasn't Boas, I don't, I don't think that, that had written it down originally, but um, I figured that it was not referencing a, a universal description of, of the shape, but uh, you know, rather the specific use in the blanket that was being described. And you can see for sure that as you go from design to design, that 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 so-called salmon trout head um, is not representing a salmon. You know, it can be a bird at times. It can be, um, you know, more of a bear or a wolf at other times. And I, I had a conversation with Bill Holm about this one, and it and he expressed it as one of his bigger regrets because it sort of sends people off on the wrong path and you will see it in contemporary northwest coast art where this where this sort of elemental design piece is actually used to represent a salmon um what it actually is is a basic scaffolding for all the art and you can see it um, you can build upon it you know if you are if you were to reflect it perfectly you have the basic beginnings of a of a human face if you curve the front end down you you're beginning to turn it into a bird and it's really the the key to understanding and and reading the art um, yeah, so in this in this box, you see it uh, in the corners, and and so what we call that is aukaji, which means the mother head, and and you know what is fundamental about that it is it's essentially the the design component out of which all the other designs grow. And so, and so for, you know, when you deal with galleries and you, and you deal with the art market, um, what you hear about so often are symmetry and cross hatching being held up as, as kind of the, the, uh, the primary way of, of reading the quality of the art in fact they uh they do they can help to show you know how much care somebody is putting into the art but they're one of the least useful uh ways of determining whether the the saju ani is correct um you know whether the the design is following good haida principles of art um, so how do I wrap this up? Okay. 
So Why could you tell us a little bit about the project with the two boxes that was just up on the screen, just mm -hmm. as a way to bring together some of those concepts you were just talking about? Yeah, I, I, it was actually over those that box there. So I, I can't remember how long ago it was now. I, I, I guess that it was 10 or 15 years ago that we went over there. Uh, Nika brought me and my little brother along on a trip to to Oxford to the Pitt Rivers Museum, and and uh, it was there that we originally ran into this box that's you know come to be known as the Great Box. You can see it's on the the original is on the left, and you know, as we encountered that box, there were, uh, you know, we're initially just blown away by how wonderful it was, you know, the feeling that it gave us. Um, it was clearly a, a masterwork of the highest order. Um, but as soon as we started to dig into it, it was also immediately apparent that um, the artist was a, a real explorer. You know, he wasn't purely sticking to the to the formalities. You know, the way that I was raised into the art, uh, th both through Bill and through my dad, is. Uh, um, you know, letting us know that there's, that it's really important that we, you know, strictly adhere to the rules and, and terminology, like rules uh, sort of uh, penetrated uh, into the fiber of my being. This, this artist broke, you could say he broke all kinds of rules. Um, I think that he just exercised his freedom as an artist and it and it and that's why I, I'm calling them formalities. You know, I don't I don't think rules necessarily covers it because you know you look at it and you know that it's immediately know that it's high to art. But uh, but if you dig into it, you could see all the exploration that he did. So you know, me and Joel, and we could see and get why some things were were done, and and uh, and other things we wondered about, and uh, had mentioned to Laura Pierce that probably the only way we would ever have a chance of figuring it out would be to uh, retrace the footsteps uh, of this artist, um, and five years later almost to the day we were out there and it was over carving this box that uh, me and Jolin uh, started formulating the the first uh, steps around uh, around sort of rediscovering the language um, uh, and and I'll just wrap up that language bit and maybe maybe I'll 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 uh, wrap up all together with um, one of the things that I think that we discovered. I, I'm not, I'm not absolutely confident to to declare this, um, but one of the things that we found was there's so much of the artwork in inside of the the. Um, the language with the shape classifiers and, and whatnot. I kind of wonder if it wasn't that the, the, um, the Haida art was just embedded into the language and that's why there was no record of it is that it was, that it was just plainly there for, for everybody at the time and didn't need explanation for people in, that, in those days. 
Guai, um, yes. would you mind also maybe, you know, the, the child of the great box is also, uh, you know, just circling back to Bill Reed again, you first started to learn about high to art working with Bill Reed by copying the final exam box. Could you just maybe quickly tell a little bit about that story? Yeah, I think that's probably a, a pretty uh, common experience for Haida artists is that we go through a, a, a period and, and I would say that mine hasn't ended, that it continued with the child of the great box, but we go through a period of classical training, which is to say that we, we uh, work, we're assigned uh, great uh, historical works to to recreate in order to in order to get an understanding. So when I was living with Bill, I he would send me out to um, visit Bill McLennan at the at the Museum of Anthropology um, with specific boxes for me to look at and to recreate, and uh, and then also the uh, final exam, which is one of the um, most exciting and innovated and, and uh, you know, I think in, in Bill's opinion, the, one of the best boxes that are out there. And he would have me do copy upon copy upon copy of that box, uh, which I would present to him and he would edit it with a jiffy marker uh, which was heartbreaking at the time, but but uh, not an experience that I would trade in ever. And maybe just uh, uh, quickly, uh, could you just also tell about how you came to be living and, and learning from Bill? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, I probably should have led with that, eh? Um, when I was 16, uh, we have a, um, a house of assembly, which is where our national government uh, for Haida people uh, comes together and they listen to what we have to say. Um, at that time, I had figured out that I'd, that I'd gone through school, you know, I was doing all right grades wise, but I, you know, I didn't know a, a verb from a noun. I didn't know any kind of multiplication tables. I, I really wasn't a good student, but somehow I was, I was skating through and I felt kind of betrayed. I, you know, I don't... Uh, I don't let myself off on, on that front, but it but it didn't really seem like there was any point for me to be in school, and and I thought that you know school, if I was going to do it, should should uh, should have challenged us more and demanded more of us. Um, so I said that at the House of Assembly, uh, which Bill happened to be sitting there, and so asked his nurse at the time who I was and if they could help me out. And, and uh, you know, I mean, he's got a long history with my dad. So when he found out who I was, then he invited me down. He yanked me out of school and, and I lived for a year with him and Martine learning art. And, you know, that is, that is a big part of my first steps into Hyde art, though I though I'd been around it all my life, it is it is the push that I needed. Thanks so much for sharing that. We have a couple of questions, so maybe I can put them to both Y and Nika. And uh, um, I'll turn on my video, sorry. <laughs> um, maybe we could uh, put a couple of questions to Guay and Nika and, and uh, people please feel free to add more questions. And I just really so appreciate 
you uh, sharing all the your story and the background and and this in, interesting new developments with language. Uh, it it's it just broadens our knowledge of Northwest Coast and Haida art. So um, I'm just going to uh, the the first question is about what is the most common motif or shape that gets used in the art, and I think why you spoke a little bit about that, but maybe the uh, uh, person asking the question didn't quite understand because we didn't have the image on the screen at the time. Uh, Seth, yeah. You could put up the two boxes again. Well, can I tackle this one, Nika? The, the um, can you guys still see me too at the same time as these boxes? Yes. Okay, so, so, um, there's, there's a, f a bunch of different schools and, and, and ways that people like to talk about the art. Um, but I follow the Bill Reed school. So, um, what Bill told me is that the fundamental shape of Haida art is just the line and it's a, it's a line that pinches on either end. And you'll see that at every single piece. So let me just, so just like that, something like that. It's a, it's a line that, that swells to its center and pinches on either end. And that line will connect in different ways. So if you follow up the side of the the great box you'll see that there there's this line and then it divides um, to connect to the Hans Kuhl in the corner there um, but everything so so the Hans Kuhl or the ovoid which is which is a compound shape is just that that line like this, it's bent like this, and then another line forms forms uh, a bridge. So it's so it's a compound shape. That's almost the only time you'll ever see uh, a single line come around, pinch, and then swell again. Uh, every other time, it's either it's either pinched at both ends or it has some kind of a modifier, uh, uh, a little socket, a crescent or a, or a trianeg as Robert calls it. Great, thanks Guy. And I, I love the Bill Reed school, that's wonderful. <laughs> so here the next one is a question for both uh, Nika and Guy from Natalia. Uh, Bill Reed was an artist, but he was also a great storyteller. He told stories about himself, stories about Haida culture, and these stories came alive through his artworks and artistic practices. What are the stories that define Bill Reed and his legacy as a storyteller for you in a personal way? Do you want to answer Gwai or you want to Nika? Can you can you can you run that by me? Uh, just what are the stories that uh, if you're thinking about Bill as a storyteller, um, and how they define him and who he was and his legacy as a storyteller? What are the what are the stories that come to mind for you about Bill as, as a storyteller? What are your personal connections or favorite stories or something like that? Well, um, one that, one that uh, jumps out at me, it, you know, there's, there's Bill's stories and, and, you know, the ones that he's narrated or orated or, or whatever, but, um, 
there's a story about his stories, which is that um, with the Jade Canoe or the Spirit of Haida Gwaii, he, he was supposed to come up with a story for it. And, you know, he, he, um, he was, you know, procrastinating and procrastinating and, and, you know, just kind of not delivering on it uh, until uh, one, I can't, do you, do you remember but the story, Beth? Do you remember who it was that he took into the garden? Well, wasn't it uh, he told the story to Martine? It could be Martine, yeah. So in any case, he, he, he took somebody into the garden, Martine, in all likelihood, and just uh, narrated the whole epic poem in one sitting of the spirit of Haida Gwaii, which is, which if you know that poem, it's amazing. It's amazing to think of it, of it just uh, rolling out like that, but also, um, yeah, that, that's my favorite story about him as a storyteller. I also heard that he did a similar um, thing for Out of the Silence, the narrative poem that he wrote to accompany the uh, Adelaide de Manille photographs in the 1960s. So I think it just brewed in his head until it was ready to come out. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we've no, lost uh, Mika. Oh, there she is. No, I'm here. Sorry. I'm sorry I can't turn on my screen. It's the, you know, just internet stuff. Um, yeah, no, the, uh, the Bill's poetry and philosophy and like multi-layered um, communications in a single word, uh, it, it, much like Guai's actually, different different styles, but but Guai has a, a, the same. They're speaking in in what we call English, and yet the the little I know in Haida or what I get to read that is translated, and especially when it's delivered from a, an elder's mouth is poetry and philosophy and each word has so much so so that that's always impacted me deeply and and I'm grateful that that Gwai can continue to speak English and you know Haida English in that way um I'll share two stories and and one of them and they're both personal and that's that's I think my biggest thing and I want to recognize Gwai and Beth for this. Um, I still have not had the privilege of seeing the exhibition due to the pandemic. I'm on Haida Gwaii. But I, I have been able to see photos of parts or talk extensively with Gwaii or Beth. And what, what you guys did was humanize Bill. And that is a huge thing for me as his granddaughter to have Bill humanized. Uh, he and um, so I just want to share a couple of stories in, in that way. And one is when I got to live with Bill and Martine. God, why can you imagine if we both got to live with them at the same time? <laughs> Be so fun. Anyways, um, I went to live with them and, and pretty much, you know, after stepping into Vancouver, we stepped on a plane and went to France to Martine's homeland. And, um, you know, so we got ready and got on the plane and left. And a month later, we got back to Vancouver and yada, yada. A month later, uh, Chin is in the kitchen and he, he just exclaims, hey. And I'm like, what, 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 what? I go run in. He loves ice cream. And he'd been rooting through the freezer looking for ice cream. And he uh, came across a, a gold statue <laughs> of his killer whale, the one in the sea. So the, the big bronze statue at the aquarium, he had a, you know, a smaller maquette in gold made. Um, its face is jade. So I guess what he did, because Bill was very down to earth in many ways, he's a complex man, and but part of that was being very down to earth. <laughs> And so before we left, he was worried someone might steal it. So he hid it in the freezer. 
and he forgot where he hid it and he forgot that he hid it. So when he was looking for the ice cream, he was extra happy to find that gold um, statue. And uh, the other story I would like to share is going back to the final exam, which Guai, you know, it's, I guess that's in your blood now. But um, just more recently, um, and Guai has been helping me with this and his brother, Ja, and his dad, a few others, how to everyone, uh, working with the American Museum of Natural History in New York to redo um, the Haida alcove in the in their museum and there's other indigenous curators from their respective territories working on redoing their alcoves. Anyways, I go in one time to look at the collections and um, they had them out on a table and I, they didn't know this, but I walked in the room and there's just a plethora of treasures and belongings on the table, but at the far end, it just jumped right at me. There was the final exam. And uh, I just started crying because the, the box that my chin I love so much, I was finally seeing in person. And, you know, that's one of those strings I'm talking about. And I can't explain uh, the emotions. I can't even explain why, but it felt like I was reconnecting with my chin I. And I think that speaks to the power of, of this um, extensive generational history that goes back to pre-human pre occupation on earth. So my biggest thing is Bill was human. And, and I love, I love that Gwai and Beth and others have humanized him. So Nika, um, there's a question here uh, uh, where somebody was very impressed about how uh, you spoke about how formative it was to witness Lutas's voyage to Haida Gwaii. And having learned, uh, this is one of the SFU students, about the canoe's significance to Bill Reed, they were wondering about your thoughts about why he chose to have his ashes carried to rest in a vessel that would have been made for a, as a war canoe. I'm not sure if that's correct. Well, no, that's a good question then. So, you know, it's it's called a war canoe, but really um, where that comes from. Uh, so, you know, canoes could go as big as 80 or more feet and you have different canoes for different reasons. Um, river canoes, getting, you know, just out there canoes, women's canoes, whatever it is. So um, uh, when Lutos was being paddled up the coast, we uh, left on June 21st, 1987 from Vancouver. And we arrived on at Skidigit, Haida Gwaii on July 11th, 1987. So it was quite a trek. This was in the midst of, uh, any of you are familiar with the, the Othli Gwaii stand or the Lyle Island blockade of 1985, where our people um, stood on the line to stop the, the gross logging, the, the horrendous logging that was taking place down in that region. The, the people who stood on the line and everyone behind that uh, donating their last money, their last jar of fish, uh, you know, what, or people from Switzerland or wherever it was that was supporting this was a, a world effort. At the end of the day, the world stood beside the Haida. And um, the logging stopped, but sort of in, uh, you know, the, the Canadian government decided that they would join us in, in protecting Guayhanas. Um, but it wasn't quite, you know, ironed out too good yet. They were humming and hawing, they weren't committing. And uh, so, so our friends pressures, uh, we were, you know, those were necessary too. Anyways, we're paddling home and the, and the media, you know, there was big media attention on this canoe and, you know, Miles Richardson Jr. Uh, kills like Haji Sting, our president, at, uh, who, who led us through that time. He said, when we left Vancouver, we didn't know if we were going on a war party or a celebration. Uh, not meaning physical war, just meaning more political navigating because Canada and BC had yet to formally commit to joining us. So all the way up from between June 21st and July 11th, uh, that was a question we had. 
Are we going down to Guayanas when we get to Haida Gwaii or are we going to Skidigan? So it's not really a war canoe and it never wound up having to be because on July 11th, uh, Tom McMillan, I think was it? Yes, Tom McMillan, he was the minister, uh, made the announcement that morning before we arrived on the shores in Victoria. He made the announcement that Canada and the province would acquiesce and they would join the Haida in protecting Haida Gwaii. And that's how we knew to go towards Skidigit and not Guayanas. So I forget what the question was, but that was just getting to be able to answer the question. I'm assuming, where did it go? I, I don't know where the question is. <laughs> I think it had to do about the significance of Bill also being buried in this canoe and, and uh, or, or his ashes being carried in this canoe at the end of his life. It was uh, 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 yeah. such a major work for him. Yeah, okay. So I guess that was my answer was to say it's not a war canoe, but it could be. <laughs> and um, so uh, the, you know, long ago again before missionaries, uh, we had, and, and today still to some degree have different burial practices. And um, when someone dies away from home, they were generally cremated, you know, if you're off island. Um, and I'm not saying that's why Bill was cremated, but he did die off island. And, you know, his whole life, you know, the he's the result, like so everyone else has has their leg at the impacts of, of residential school and everything else I talked about. And, and there's um, the, the Canada project, the idea there was, you know, obviously to wipe us out but if you think about the comments or or whatever it was the slogan yeah about residential school in the states it was kill the kill the indian by the time it got to canada because i guess we're a little bit more civilized the the slogan was don't kill the indian kill the indian in the child right so um gee i lost my train of thought i was getting real political there um <laughs> But oh, oh, so so you know, there's that part. And when you think about kill the Indian in the child, that's about erasing identity uh, and leaving a shell if you choose to leave the shell. And there were many mechanisms that Canada put into place to fracture identity of Indigenous people. There's Section 12B1, no, 121. B, I think it is of the Indian Act where people would lose their status that was already imposed on us. Uh, a short, a shortened version of that is that people would be disenfranchised from their community for doing certain things. Um, and when you're disenfranchised from your community, it's hard to feel like you belong. There was the uh, late, it's actually, it's called the 60s scoop, but it started in the late 50s and people, and just even today in, in the, the system, the so-called child welfare system, the, the number of indigenous children in, in care and not in indigenous care uh, compared to other backgrounds is horrendous. So you've got people back from the late 50s forward being taken out of their homes. You have people that had to endure residential school and being taken away from their homes. You have people starting to not feel like they're Haida because, because of how the Canada Project decided and encouraged others to look at us and decide if we're Haida, right? So all of that is a fracturing of identity and Bill was, Bill was a, a, a result of that as well with a mother who did everything she could to be mistaken for a Victorian woman. My old nun, I went to church day school in Skidigit and she came out at, I believe, age six being ashamed to be Haida and then was shipped off to residential school. So Bill's life when he found, and I can't speak for him, I'm analyzing, okay, I didn't talk to him about this when, when he was here. Um, but we know from his other sharings and other writings, you know, he, he wasn't connected. He grew up off island. He had, in his young life, he started to make connections and, and uh, he wanted to come home. And when I say that, I don't just mean physically, I mean spiritually wanted to feel like he belonged. And, you know, that's a journey that I think many of us are on in different ways. 
And uh, so, you know, Martine honoring, that is a big thing. And we brought him home and we buried him in his home village of Tanu. It's such a beautiful story. And uh, Gwai and I had lots of discussions about this as we were putting together the exhibition. And Gwai, do you want to just um, add a few words? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think Bill made so many connections with home. Like, I, like I, that's one of the, the elements of his legacy. You know, I, I got to work with him, but, but you know, he had quite an open door in his studio and so many people, people kind of passed through his studio and learned from him and, and, you know, in so doing, were able to pass their knowledge along as well. Um, oh shoot, there's something else I was thinking of. Um, what is the last thing you're talking about, Nika? that he wanted to go home <laughs> or do you mean the, the fracturing of identity oh yeah well i mean that is something else that's that's always uh slightly disturbed me i guess about about bill um is so often in his in his narrations and stuff like that he would speak of Haida people in third person and, um, you know, it is, it's sort of uh, heartbreaking because, because, you know, we owe so much to him in, in what is the contemporary Haida legacy. Um, and, and yet on some level, he, he, he seemed to uh, struggle with being able to, to own Haida-ness uh, you know, with his words. Yeah, and and how about Guai too for for um, uh, adding? You know, he did have connections. I don't want to make it sound like he didn't. And your what you just said helps me because a lot of the fracturing of identity, uh, there's the external forces, but then there's the internal part where you can completely feel like you're not connected and yet not realize that your entire community doesn't think of you as not Haida or, or not part of the community. It's a real impact. It's, an, it's a huge impact that I have seen on, and you can be too dark, you can be too light. You, you know, you grew up off reserve, you grew up in the city. You, it's amazing what um, colonial regimes have done in that way. Sorry, I know I'm harping on it, but that is the mm -hmm. core of it. There's actually a related question here uh, uh, from one of the students about, uh, it says, Bill Reed had his fair share of critics and with his legacy being somewhat complex, how is Bill perceived in the broader Haida community today? Are criticisms of him still common or have these mostly dis dissipated in the years after his death? And I kind of think some of that criticism had to do with that sense of identity. Gee, I hope he doesn't stop being a mischievous character. You know, we've always got to have some, you know, if some, if everyone's happy, then no one's listening. <laughs> and he yeah. was mischievous. <laughs> he is mischievous. Um, he was, he was tough. Um, but, you know, I, I think that the, um, the controversy is a little overblown. You know, they, I probably everybody that um, had to deal with Bill, um, you know, had to deal with um, some gruffness, some trickiness, all that kind of thing. Um, but I, I think the core of that controversy comes from, you know, some, some uh, journalists sort of compiling everybody's worst stories and 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 sort of making a mountain out of a molehill. So um, 
uh, Nika had just spoken a little bit about the uh, the Lyle Island protests and um, uh, there's another question that asks a bit about um, how do you and your Haida relatives convey your passion to protect your land and water to the government and people of Canada? Just a, a point of order there is it wasn't a protest, but rather a, an, an assertion of Haida law on our territories. Thank you for the correction, yeah. Um, Sorry, I got I got uh, caught up in the semantics. What's the co core of that question? Just how 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 are the Haida people conveying uh, their passion for protecting land and and water to the government these days? I mean, we talked about that in the early eighties. Yeah, it's a it's a bit of a different landscape now. Um, you know, they're they're. There have been other um, sort of drastic movements over the years where we where we asserted ourselves. Um, you know, the one in my lifetime after Athli Gwai was, uh, um, you know, we had we had uh, the sports fishing shut, shut down um, when I was. I think I was about 14 and then we shut down the the logging through the center swath of Haida Gwaii and were able to half the AAC and 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 part of that was taking over the largest tree farm license. Um, that's led to kind of a um, perhaps a um, uh, uh, conflict within our own personality. You know, we've been fighting so long and then we've, then in that time we shifted into being in industry ourselves. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think it's been a challenging time for Haida's, uh, to find ourselves in, in this, uh, place of management and and uh and i think we're st still like in the thick of that uh process of discovery um you know we we need to have industry we need to to run things but we also need to maintain our height of values through it all Nika, do you want to add yeah, it? Yeah, I'll build off that. Yeah, um, and I'll get into one of those semantics too. So, uh, and it is absolutely a passion, but I think the underneath the passion is a privilege and that is a privilege of responsibility. So, um, you know, we're, Gwai and I and so everyone else, we're so um, lucky, we're so privileged to grow up uh, listening like being being having the opportunity to listen to our elders our leaders uh in the potlatch in our homes on the political realm uh, with the external world and um that instills or, or i know it instilled in me um without having to spell it out a real sense of responsibility bill's work left me with a sense of responsibility it's probably a large i won't credit him entirely but a large part of my finding my way into a museum. Um, so the passion is, is a responsibility and there's many different ways to convey it. And, and, and I'm really glad Gwai recognized we're human too. Hey, you know, we, we are human and we have to wayfind and we have to do things. Some, some of the other social justice uh, or some social justice moves, you know, if you want to call them that, we can identify them by, by uh, saving our language, by bringing home our ancestors' remains from museums around the world um, through asserting uh, diplomatically but firmly our inherent rights and titles to Haida Gwaii, 
while also carrying the responsibility of understanding that everything depends on everything else. And we need to um, steel ourselves to find ways to move forward together with our neighbors. And so it's not a, it's, and I'm, I'm not making it complex. It's a really complex thing to have a passion that's fueled by responsibility. Um, you can't just look at yourself. So I would say in that, it's, I'm so appreciative of everyone that, that, you know, pulled into this parking lot today. And, and, and I think those are the things we need allies to do or allies to be, to do is learn and ask these questions and listen. Um, that is your responsibility. So how for that? I have another question here, uh, which is sort of interesting because it's really a bit about how the Haida are perceived elsewhere in the world as well. So it links to while Lutas was made to be actively used by the Haida people as a seafaring canoe, the spirit of Haida Gwaii being placed far from Haida Gwaii on the, on the East Coast in, in Washington, DC, as well as the Vancouver airport um, is clearly for artistic value and non-Indigenous, non-Haida people to view and learn from is one more valuable than the other to Haida people and or to Haida culture or to you specifically? Either of you want to take a... <laughs> I, I'll take a stab at it. I, I, I was wondering if Nico was going to tackle it, but... Um, uh, I will ask you. Okay, so, so I'll give a, a really basic answer to that. Um, which hopefully I can be basic anyways. Uh, you know, my, my business is art. So, so, you know, that's, that's how I, how I feed myself and my family. And, and, you know, it, it serves me, it excites me to, to extend the, the reach of Haida art. Um, but really like when, when I, when I do that, when I, when I can engage in projects, for instance, you know, me and my brother did a, a series of, of kind of mechanical max, masks. Uh, it is really a, a pretense to get us out into the world and, and out to look at Haida pieces in museums to give us a chance to, to explore and learn. And so the, the works and the pieces that have the most meaning for me anyways, is, is when they are, are pieces that can be at home you know, pieces that can be enjoyed by our own people. Raising a pole at home is, is, is the best. I agree with Guai on that. Um, how I see the, the bronze, uh, there's one at the international airport as well. And there's the white cast, uh, what was that plaster, I guess, Guai? at the mm -hmm. CMH at the mm -hmm. yeah so you know I'll, so you know you could talk about any of the three this way but why do you think it's appropriate if I tell the story about the slight repositioning chin I did of the black canoe in Washington I, I was wondering about that but I, I would say yes in my humble opinion okay <laughs> yay okay then I can blame it all on you um, <laughs> so so uh, I couldn't make it to the unveiling of the black canoe. You know, my mom went down and other family, quite a, quite a cohort from Haida Gwai went down, hey, and Bill's chief and Gwai's dad, Gu Zhao. And anyways, um, Arthur Erickson designed the space in which the, spirit, uh, the black canoe would go. And this was all a big deal, of course. And um, it is, you know, it's for other people. Oh, I shouldn't get into that. That doesn't matter right now. We're just looking about placing the canoe. And um, Arthur had a very specific angle in which it's going to go down. 
and um, somehow I guess Chin and I arranged that that because um, they were arguing a bit about the angle and this is his good friend hey Arthur's his good friend and uh, so he, he did something that Arthur's attention was taken away for a bit and then and then Bill redirect like he told the engineers to just shift it a little bit to the right I think it was and by the time Arthur got back the canoe was in place on the ground and uh, wasn't too happy about it anyways Gujo asked Gujo asked Bill about it later you know why'd you do that and he said well just turn it a little bit more to the right and then the bear's ass is facing the Canadian consulate or something like that so there's little humors you know he wasn't being a jerk he was making fun like having some fun with it and um so I guess what I'm doing there is saying there's intrinsic value to that piece <laughs> on very like minor minuscule levels but but as a big uh contemporary piece of work that as is Haida and contains Haida and all that they do serve as beacons. Like I know when we have our little delegations that fly out of Vancouver internationally, we always gather in front of the canoe and take a picture. Um, when we went to Washington to do research, like what Guy was speaking of, going to see pieces at the Smithsonian, it was a great trip. We went and gathered at the Black Canoe. So it, there is intrinsic value and there's that string that, of connection um, and then as for, you know, us being able to share with the world, you know, we're here and um, people appreciate that. And maybe that it acts as a conduit, you know, to make future friends. And we live in a bigger world now than it, than it was back in the day. I'm thinking, um, I forgot this was recorded. Maybe we should take that story out, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's documented elsewhere. Okay. So you're not the first to tell it. Uh, um, I have one other question here from, uh, and then we're a couple of minutes over time. I hope you're okay just to answer a couple more questions quickly. Um, one of the other students in the class is asking, is Bill Holmes' book still the main reference for Haida artists today? And are there any new forms being created if that is allowed? Maybe why that follows off of what you were talking about. Uh, yeah, I would say that Holmes' book is is still sort of the you know outside of outside of the kind of classical training that I'm talk that I was talking about early, like like just immersing yourself in the old pieces. Um, Bill, Bill Holmes' book is still sort of the seminal work and, and still the best piece of, of published, published uh, work for, for, uh, for getting a good understanding of the art. Um, now, now I, I think that the, the second part of the question is like, you know, outside of, of, of ovoids, U shapes and and uh, salmon trout heads or whatever uh, are there are there new shapes and uh, I guess like like that that question becomes irrelevant if you once you break it down to that single pinched line because if when you're working from that pinched line you know as long as you you are following that the fundamental rules of of the flow and the tension uh you can make really any shape with it but i don't know of any any like particular shapes being named anew but it but it could be are there other key resources that you would recommend at all for people to look or learn more about it? Well, um,
I mean, if, if you're talking about just the nuts and bolts of the, of, of the art, um, you know, any, any of the books that have images in it are, are fine just to look at. Um, you know, what, what Bill Holm did was, uh, you know, sort of a scientific approach. So just look at, at all the boxes and, and, and sort of keep a chart of how many times they use this type of transition, how many times they use this other kind of transition and, and broke it down. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, it's, it's great. And at the same time, like there are spots, you know, it's, it, these are linguistic things that I think do the art a disservice, you know, ideas like primary and secondary form line where the, where the elements, what, what uh, Bill Reed called the embroidery uh, is relegated to a to a second shift in in the design, uh, where actually a lot of the storytelling happening happens inside of the embroidery, and 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 it shouldn't be um, you know shouldn't be notched down in its in its degree of importance in the overall design. So I think we'll, um, I've got one last question, if you'll have patience with us, because it's a very interesting question. Uh, and it's specifically towards Nika. Um, and it comes from Laura. <laughs> and she says, just gone, you have worked with Haida ancestral treasures in museums all over. How has your experience with Bill affected how you approach ancestral treasures in museums? Hi, Laura, my dear friend. Um, Laura, actually, for people uh, to know, Laura Pierce was um, at the Pitt Rivers and was the person we were able to work with in a really good way to go over there. And that's where Ja and Guai uh, discovered the box, the great box, and, and she worked with the, them on the project to have it done. It's nice to see you, or your name anyways. Um, how have I've worked? Okay, how has it changed? Or how has it affected? How has how your experience with Bill affected how you approach ancestral treasures in museums? I'm gonna have to give that one thought, Laura, that is a really, really good question. I know he's influenced me throughout everything in life. And I know that I bawled when I saw the final exam. And, you know, when we went to the British, when uh, Lucy, uh, oh no, sorry, Lucy, it wasn't you, it was Vince. When my cousin Vince and I went to England in 2002, and seeing uh, at the British Museum and Jonathan King was, uh, you know, brought us around so we could look at our treasures and, and there's a, a bear head rattle there. It's absolutely extraordinary. And, uh, you know, Chennai had done that in a, in a series of doorknobs, I think really high end doorknobs or something, but just beautiful. But to see the original and, and, and feel that connection again, and you kind of understand like little moments like that, you're like, yeah, this is this has to be done. We have to do this work. Bill did this work. Robert does this work. Jim does this work. Dolores Churchill, like, we have to carry it on. This is part of our life now, you know. Um, but I, I'm gonna have to give that some thought, Laura. Hawa. I, I have a I have a a tangent to that, which is it, as we go through the museum. This is this is me and my little brother. Um, you know we really often feel the presence of those sort of more senior artists that cut their teeth going into museums and you know they had to fight their way in at times to get into the storage rooms and stuff like that but we could really get a sense either through their through works that we're familiar with like the like the doorknob that that Nick is talking about um, or, or just because we've had 
conversations with them, Phil, as well as, you know, uh, Robert and other, other senior artists. Um, and Oh, shoot. I lost the track of my thought on that one. Um, well, we talked a lot about it during the show, our put, thing up the show, how much Bill didn't have access to those items, right? And so he had to, it took him many years and many uh, of traveling around and digging up things in, in libraries and books and museums. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, so so that's the other thing. And, and uh, hi, Laura. Um, you know, I, I really want to acknowledge that uh, what a great experience it was. A, it was an experience like like no other museum experience up to up to that time when we went to the Pit Rivers. You know how they allowed us uh, access, kind of an unfettered access to our ancestral pieces. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, without, without sort of time limitations, um, you know, so, so often before that our experience in museums was really like tucked into a back corner of the storage room with, with gloves and a couple, a couple curators sort of, sort of hanging over our shoulders. And in, in this situation, it was it was totally a, a welcoming experience, and they really um, um, allowing us to explore. And because we are such a big and diverse group of Haidas that went there, I think it also uh, served them quite a bit because the conversation spanned, uh, you know, linguists, artists, spiritual practitioners, uh, uh, people who have a curatorial or academic approach to the art that uh, we had youth amongst us. Um, and one of the things that uh, grew out of that was at that time, me and Jolin had not worked together before, um, uh, but Jolin had apprenticed with our dad. I'd worked with our dad as well as apprenticed with Bill. Googe had worked with Bill and was kind of passing Bill's lessons as well down to both of us. But um, even though we had never worked together, we, uh, we shared a language around the art and we we're able to communicate with each other over pieces. A, a lot of the time we were communicating without even using words and we're able to carry on conversations that we're just having, you know, with our eyes or maybe the odd lip point uh, uh, while we we're in the museum. And from that, we wound up working together and carving a pole together. And, and you know, we've ever since heading out there, we've, we've uh, collaborated together. But this is sort of the long way of, of saying that, you know, we inherited uh, a, a curiosity and a way of speaking about the art from Bill through, through various uh, uh, transitions, uh, which, which um, led to us working together finally. And I think that's actually, it, you know, basically summarizes what the unbroken line is, is all about, right? And, uh, um, and I think we should wrap it up there just because we've gone over time and, and I know we haven't gotten to all of the questions. I apologize if we didn't get directly to your question, but I think there's been some wonderful, wonderful stories and uh, thoughts shared today. And I just thank you so much to Nika and Guai and uh, also to SFU for all their help. And uh, I hope you'll um, uh, you know, be able to revisit this uh, presentation because it will be shared through both the Bill Reed Center and the Bill Reed Gallery uh, websites and uh, uh, shortly. And thank you all today for joining in. We really appreciate it. Take care. Have a great evening.